Hi everyone, my name is Madhvi Pandya and I'm a biomedical honors student this year. It's a, it is a pleasure for me to present in front of you a very hot topic in research today. So ignoring the title of my project here, let, let me see how many of you can guess what health issue, issue I'm talking about today. So what, what comes to your mind when, you, when I say the following things? Say memory loss, confusion, forgetfulness, mood swings. I bet we're all thinking of that one friend who still owes us money, right? I mean, forgetfulness, confusion, sounds just about right. Or it could just be signs of old age, right? But how many of you thought of Alzheimer's disease as a diagnosis after listening to those symptoms? Not many, I bet. Oh, we have a judge <laughs> who has. <laughs> Alzheimer's disease is something that occurs in the later stage of life, but these symptoms precede and are the basis of diagnosis as of today. Currently, sensory loss has been researched lately in Alzheimer's disease where vision and hearing has been affected. Me personally, I'm interested in vision problems in Alzheimer's disease. So I'll be looking at ocular biomarkers related to Alzheimer's disease and how they cause retinal pathologies. Sounds like a mouthful, but what I'm pretty much investigating is whether the same pathology that occurs in the brain occurs in the retina as well, affecting vision. Currently, there are 53,000 New Zealanders diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and this number ha is expected to rise at a very alarming rate. It is costing us millions of dollars in pharmaceutical needs, caregiver programs, hospital visits, etc. We need to act, and act fast. But where do we begin? There are two molecular aspects of Alzheimer's disease. One, amyloid pathology. Two, tau hyperphosphorylation. Me personally, I'm interested in the amyloid pathology. So within the brain cells, there is a transmembrane protein called amyloid precursor protein, or APP for short, which is involved in synaptic function, iron regulation, hormonal release, etc. It is regulated by beta secretase enzymes and gamma secretase enzymes, which ultimately leads to one byproduct called beta amyloid peptide, which is known to be toxic. Beta amyloid leads to cell loss, inflammation, oxidation, even vision problems, all leading ultimately to Alzheimer's disease. So, is beta amyloid the bad guy here, the one causing Alzheimer's disease? Well, the answer lies within the structure of this protein. There are many isomers of this protein ranging from 36 to 43 amino acid long. But research shows that beta amyloid 40 and beta amyloid 42 are responsible for Alzheimer's disease. The protein on its own has a random coil shape, but when the concentration of this protein increases in, within an area, they self-assemble themselves into fibrils. And these fibrils are known to have beta sheet formation. Interestingly, research shows that beta sheets are related to autofluorescence something that fluoresces when emitted, when excited with a specific spectrum of light. Maybe we could exploit this property of this protein. This leads to the hypotheses of my research, using autofluorescence-dependent diagnostic tests for detection of amyloid protein. Great, now we have a hypothesis, but where can we test this? Well, how about the eyes? There are four reasons to why we should look at eyes for Alzheimer's biomarkers. One, because of the retinal and neuropath neuro neuronal and, uh, origin is the same, we suspect that retina expresses the same enzymes and proteins involved in the amyloid pathway. Also, there's confirmed presence of beta amyloid within the retina, and there has been visual difficulties observed between AD patients. One study even goes further to say that the retinal plaques precede the plaques in the observed in the brain in the transgenic mice model. How is this related to current theories? Well, currently, there have been companies who have invested large sums of money in building equipments that detect this. So the image here shows curcumin-based labeling of beta amyloid within the retina. Curcumin is a protein that is autofluorescent and binds to beta amyloid peptide. But this makes it an invasive diagnostic test where the curcumin has to be injected to reach the retina. But if the beta amyloid peptide on its own is autofluorescent, we would not need this and it would become a non-invasive diagnostic test. Which brings me to the aims of my hypothesis. 
Is there presence of beta amyloid within the retina in Alzheimer's patient? If so, is it autofluorescent? If so, can we use this as a diagnostic test? I've used a transgenic mice model to test this theory, simply by imaging tre treated tissue versus untreated tissue. My mouse model includes two major groups. One, the control, which are the wild type animal. Two, this transgenic model, which contains a human APP gene and a PS1 mutation. PS1 mutation occurs in the enzymes I've mentioned earlier to increase the production of beta amyloid peptide. This shows the sectioning of the tissue, which, observe, which we can see the cornea and the anterior side and the retina on the bottom, which we're interested in. Retina is where the light processing occurs. This image shows the layers of the retina with photoreceptor layers on the top that detect light, a uh, ganglion cell layer on the bottom, which process the, this light into electrical signals which are sent to the brain. The preliminary data comes from the Degus model, which is a naturally occurring Alzheimer's model, which has the same pathological and behavioral changes like a human patient would. The image here in the blue um, stain is stained by DAPI, which stains the cell nucleuses. As you can see, it is a pretty healthy retina. The image here shows autofluorescence in the red channel. These dots indicated here are just natural tissue on its own without any treatment. This image here shows the photo bleaching, which is the next step. So we were able to quench the, photo, uh, the autofluorescence using two hours of UV exposure. Then my colleague was able to label the same tissue with 4G8. Now this 4G8 is an antibody specific for beta amyloid. Hmm, this pattern looks familiar. If you look at it, the tissue before and after has a similar staining pattern. The dots observed before are pretty much in the same region observed after the 4G8 labeling. That brings me to my mouse model. In my mouse model, despite the fact that there's high background autofluorescence, what we're interested in are the dots here indicated by the arrows. Compared to the Degus model, my mouse model has the dots appearing in the outer nuclear layer, which is just photoreceptors, which has photoreceptors present. So the next step was to photo bleach. Well, there's bad news because I wasn't able to completely quench the, uh, the autofluorescence, even despite two hours of UV and 30 minutes of copper sulfate exposure. So this led to troubleshooting. Why is there high autofluorescence in my tissue? This could be because of the fixation and the handling of the tissue before and after. So to overcome this, I use confocal microscopy techniques to help me distinguish between autofluorescence and the signal. Just to mention, to make this study a little more interesting, I was blinded to the study and as I was unaware of the state of the mouse to see whether I was able to distinguish between the wild type and the transgenic. So mouse A here is before, before treatment and this is after treatment. As you can see, we see no dots appearing in either of those stainings, which leads me to believe that this mouse was in fact a wild type. However, in mouse B, we see the dotted patterns before and after, leading me to believe that this is a transgenic mice model. Mice. Also, mouse C has the same pattern. And we can see by the circles that the dots before and after co-localize, and they're found in the same region as before. This leads me to believe that, in fact, that yes, there is beta amyloid present, and yes, there is autofluorescence in the tissue, and yes, we can detect this. After revealing myself to the state of the animals, it was in fact true that yes, mouse A was wild type, mouse B and C were both transgenic. What further studies I would like to do is we have confirmed the presence of beta amyloid, now we want to see the effect it has on the tissue itself. So far on the timeline of Alzheimer's, vision has been a very hot topic of discussion, and I hope that my research leads to a pre to an early diagnostic test to decrease the incidence of Alzheimer's. All in all, maybe we should get that friend checked. We may not get our money back, but at least we can save a life. Thank you.
if this works, right, yep. and you develop a non-invasive diagnostic test, there is no treatment for... Um, Not yet, but if we do catch it early, there is uh, different things you could do with lifestyle changes, diet changes, and etc. that have been... Ex that are under experiment at the moment that can reduce the progression of the disease so we can have a better quality of life and a sl maybe slightly longer life than a normal Alzheimer's patient would at the moment. Yep? I'm, I'm curious, do you only have three samples? I do have more samples, but as I was running out of time, I only had time to put three in there. But yes, I do have evidence from other samples to suggest the same thing. It's true, because if you actually look at the, um, the, the example you showed, where you compare um, the before treatment and after treatment, the points are, aren't actually at the same positions. This is big. There's a similar pattern, but they're not exactly at the same positions. That's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that, because this is before treatment and this is after treatment. So this requires a lot of washing, uh, exposure to antibodies and washing again and again, which does damage the morphology of the tissue. So the shape of it does change and therefore we cannot say they come from the exact same point. Yeah, it's just the processing of the tissue doesn't allow us to do that.